analyzing this from like an academic perspective, I know you, you have a PhD, you were at the Quincy Institute studying the Middle East before you joined the State Department. When you're looking at United States diplomacy and standing in the world, what does this support for Israel do for American credibility in the region and internationally, just more broadly? And if you could compare that to the the degradation of international standing that the United States saw happen to it in the wake of the Iraq war. Um, what, what are your observations there about U S standing in the middle East from a, um, a diplomatic perspective? I, you know, I, I think you're very right to highlight the effects of the Iraq war and, you know, the, the, illegal uh, means that the U.S., that the, you know, Bush administration used to invade Iraq. Um, I do think that this administration had tried to really reestablish some of, of, like I was saying, America's participation in international institutions. I think the many people, especially within the State Department, saw U.S. support for Ukraine as a means to sort of reestablish American credibility, standing up for a democracy, um, you know, a civilian population undergoing a, an illegal invasion and assault. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the Ukraine-Gaza juxtaposition just really highlights the hypocrisy here. Um, and I think that has been a that was something that came up frequently with State Department colleagues that when Ukraine happened, they would they talked about how they were encouraged to support Ukraine, even if they weren't working on Ukraine, just, you know, wear wear a Ukraine flag pin or like put up a put up a poster or something. Whereas with Gaza, the message people were getting was this isn't your area. You don't work on this. You know, you don't know what you're talking about. And, and just, you know, I think the American self image was so ready to grab onto this support for Ukraine as a means of reestablishing um, America's self respect af in kind of the aftermath of, of the war on terror. Um, and I think that the the ongoing support for Israel has just really reaffirmed the extent to which um, that self-image is false. And although I personally would really welcome if the U.S. government were to try to adopt policies that did affirm human rights and all of these ideas about American exceptionalism and standing up for the rule of law and the world, you know, the, the liberal international order, um, but in general, we we don't see that happening, um, and I do think it it has been a huge blow to American credibility. Uh, you know, it's made a mockery of the UN, the UN Security Council. You know, the US abstained on that vote, but then immediately came out and said it was a non-binding resolution, which is a lie because UN Security Council <laughs> resolutions, by by definition, are supposed to be binding. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I. This was a question I asked, you know, the State Department has held open fora um, about Gaza, which I, I really welcome that they were, you know, inviting people to speak about this. Many, many people were concerned and devastated um, and continue to be. But this was a question I asked of a senior official, which was, it seems that this policy, this, this U.S. support for Israel is being treated as more important than the question of China, which this administration likes to talk about, the question of Ukraine, which, again, big priority, Russia, climate change, human rights, participation in international institutions, you know, a, a foreign policy for the middle class, whatever that's supposed to mean, just all of these priorities the administration campaigned on and claimed to be governing in the name of or you know, making decisions to support why is the U.S. Israel relationship seen as more important than all of these other questions, many of which are existential? I would, you know, climate change, you know, a great power war with China. I mean, that would be, you know, it could be nuclear annihilation. I mean, you know, like these are huge issues. And yet the ongoing support for this far right wing government in Israel 
for some reason is seen as more important. And that, you know, the official didn't have a good answer to that question. Um, I still don't have a good answer. Can you give us a sense of how unique the the relationship is within you know diplomatic the uh, channels between the United States and Israel? How other relationships, maybe within the purview of your office or your colleagues, might be treated with within the normal kind of day to day work of the State Department versus the very top down and let's be clear this is from biden himself this is clearly ideological for him as he's a zionist and he has said so um how unique that is from the other work of the state department and how that kind of feels within the work in the state department certainly um that's a good question i think that you know so like with my office which focuses or my former office focuses on human rights um, it's very easy to criticize Iran or Syria, rightly. These are, these are governments that engage in horrific human rights violations. Um, but so does Saudi Arabia and so does Israel. Um, so does the UAE. So, and yet those, those countries are routinely not called out for their human rights violations. In terms of your question of the uniqueness of Israel, I would I would, you know, my previous work at Quincy focused primarily, a, a lot of it focused on um, the Saudi war on Yemen. And in particular, things like the US saying they were going to cut off offensive weapons to Saudi Arabia, which initially they sort of did. Um, it, it remains the official policy. Um, we talked about this actually, I'm remembering now, because yeah. offensive weapons were categorized in this very broad sense and, you know, uh, uh, or offensive weapons was quite specific and defensive could mean anything, basically. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. I'm and remembering now. Yeah. It, and, it, and, you know, so just, just to highlight there that even though the U.S.-Saudi relationship is extremely important um, in terms of you know, the way it has been understood for decades. Um, but the but Biden still was willing to take that step of cutting off offensive weapons as wobbly, you know, although there were some, uh, some there was some wiggle room there, they still publicly took this step. And, you know, and until the notorious fist bump with MBS, you know, initially Biden was maintaining a degree of distance from the, the Saudi throne. Um, which was which was new. That was um, that is not what we've seen with Israel. There have been no no willingness to cut off weapons. Um, no, you know, even even when Netanyahu you know canceled the visit to just come ask for more weapons, and now he's rescheduling the visit to talk about the impending invasion of Rafah, which is going to be, as I mentioned in the op-ed. Um, I mean, it's, it's, I don't even, I can't even talk about it. Um, and, and, you know, Biden isn't, isn't doing anything different. He's just continuing to support what this, what this government is doing. Um, I think what I'm also really concerned about is um, the war expanding and, Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I've, I've cried a million times on the show about this. So <laughs> yeah, it's good to have another soft hearted woman around to cry with me. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, um, you know, I really worry about the U.S. getting dragged into another war in the Middle East. Um, you know, I know many, you know, the majority of Americans, when you pull them, are really tired of, you know, sending young people to go die in the Middle East. And I think that this administration is not doing enough or really much of anything significant to, to insist to Israel that if Bibi invades Lebanon, the U.S. is not going to back him up. I think in contrast, Bibi knows the U.S. would back him up if he did that, and that's why he's preparing to do so. Um, and and the bombing of, of the Iranian uh, embassy in 
in uh, <clears throat> in Syria uh, yeah. overnight. I mean, on uh, yesterday, that is also a major escalation that I'd imagine is extremely concerning to you. Absolutely, and it, it's because Netanyahu's political interests are best served by keeping all the violence going as long as possible. I mean, I feel like there's been insufficient attention to the fact that, or the, that the Israeli hostages are sort of held up as like, well, Hamas just have to, has to give back the hostages, which they do. But Bibi's not interested in that because then he wouldn't be able to, to continue to justify all this violence. I mean, if that was actually his primary goal, that could have happened months ago. I mean, that could have happened within the first few weeks. But that's not his goal. And I think, you know, the families of the hostages who are just desperate to get their family members back are not, you know, they're they're protesting. There have been huge protests in Israel against the fact that the, the government of Israel is prioritizing bombing and starving the people of Gaza and now likely expanding this war into a, like a regional, what could become a nuclear conflagration. And, and it's, and it, you know, and yet, criticism of Israel continues to be tarred as anti-Semitic when, you know, this government is not listening to their own people. It's yeah. so, it's, I, it's just so, um, I don't understand why this continues to be the policy that the U.S. government just continues to support. Um, you know, there are all these questions about American credibility and, you know, other governments crossing red lines and, you know, like, this is going to send a signal that China can invade Taiwan. You're like all every, you know, there's all this like analysis about how the U.S. has to stand firm on its on what it says it's it's committed to, what the red lines are, and and that hasn't, and yet you know, BB keeps crossing all of these red lines, and you know, where are all those people shouting about? You know, the U.S. has to like maintain credibility on these issues. Right. It's it's maddening. Um, it's, it's infuriating. And I mean, I, if I haven't said it before, I, I really just respect your courage immensely on this and, and to speak for some of your colleagues who may not, you know, um, it's, it's really hard to, to leave your job. Uh, and this we don't have a ton of social safety net in this in this country to allow for that. So um, being able to, to hear your inside perspective on this is invaluable. And, and you mentioned Saudi Arabia earlier. Um, the U.S. prioritizing Israel is also affecting massive uh, deals with Saudi Arabia in us warming to them once again. The Biden administration is pursuing the Abraham Accord path that the Trump administration furthered, which Hamas has said, and I think military experts agree, contributed to their desperation to attack on October 7th because they felt this is our one chance and we're being cut out and forgotten entirely as the United States recognizes another major Arab power in the region. Um, what has been your response, and perhaps if you feel comfortable speaking for your colleagues, some of them, um, to the Biden administration pursuing a Trump administration policy that is destabilizing the region? Now, I won't try and speak for my colleagues, um, but just for myself, I mean, I, I think this comes directly from Brett McGurk. This this is the the policy that he has long been in favor of. And I think just as as you said, I mean, this is already the Abraham Accords were, you know, with the UAE, with Bahrain, Morocco, and Sudan, the countries that normalized with Israel in 2020. Um, that was done over the objections of their populations. Um, there was this notion that the the fate of Palestine was no longer a salient issue for Arab publics. And I think for, you know, a country like the UAE, which has so much money and a very small population, they are able, you know, they were the first and they were able to quash, they, they already have systems in place to quash dissent of all kinds. Um, you know, Morocco has seen massive protests since October 7th consistently against the fact that the Moroccan government has normalized with Israel. Um, I think if MBS were to try to normalize with Israel, it would be, 
I think he would struggle to contain the the reaction. You know, he's thus far been quite successful at suppressing dissent and opposition to some of the the changes he's made. Um, and some of these are are really positive changes, especially for Saudi women. But he has made them um, unilaterally and without any sort of you know public input. And he's you know jailed the female. Uh, women's rights activists that were pushing for such things that are now legal, like the right to for women to drive. And many of those people are still either in jail or under travel ban. Um, so uh, if, if I, and, I mean, part, part of the issue here is just the fact that it's not really necessary. Like these countries are not at war with Israel or they're not, you know, they already have a quiet relationship with Israel. Right. You know, we they they quietly do trade. Like it's just the fact that they haven't officially normalized. It doesn't mean that they are a threat to Israel. Um, you know, e just public opinion aside, these governments know. You know, like you think about like Egypt or something, where there's massive opposition to what's happening, and yet. Um, you know, the military of Egypt is extremely powerful and has managed to suppress dissent and has locked up thousands of people. And also a top recipient of our aid. Not, also, not right. A, not a exactly. coincidence. Exactly. Following the, the peace treaty, the Camp David Accord. Um, the So so all that to say that, um, first of all, the Abraham Accords are essentially unnecessary because these are not governments that are actually like threatening military action against Israel. Um, and they are deeply destabilizing because they are so unpopular in their own countries. And so I just, I, I don't really understand why it continues to be such a priority other than, you know, it's a big priority for APAC and um, DMFI and yeah, it, it's it's just continues to be seen as um, the right move politically within the American political establishment. Although I do hope that that is starting to change, as as we talked about that that you know, like when Rami Youssef was on SNL and said "Free Palestine" and people cheered, you know that that's a big shift. Yes, we we covered that yesterday. Uh, blind anti-imperialism writes in, can you ask her what she thinks about Biden's comment on his come to Jesus moment conversation he thinks he was going to have with Bibi? Does Joe actually think he's helping the situation and the pork giving aid is helping? It seems like incompetence on his end. I mean, I, I don't know. I've asked myself this of like, is he just deluded? Is it just, you know, he's just, it's just a generational issue, like his generation and others just Israel is exists differently in their imagination than it does in reality. Um, or is he just, does he just not care about the people in Gaza? Like, is it, is it racism? Like, I don't know. I don't really know. Um, I, I think it's, you know, I think part of how he got elected is because people saw him as as like generally a pretty good guy was like his persona. Um, I think that's kind of how I saw him. And 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 now I just kind of question that because I don't know how he would like how his staff would be insulating him from what's happening to people in Gaza. And if and yet he continues to make these same decisions.